Let me encourage you to take your Bibles today and turn with me in God's Word to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 25, as we'll be looking today starting with verse 10. Exodus chapter 25 starting with verse 10. If you've been with us, you know that the last several weeks we've been speaking about God's tabernacle, how He came to dwell with His people while they were there in uh, the land of the desert, wandering before they got to the promised land. They had to have a mobile ark, a mobile uh, ark of the covenant, a mobile tent, a mobile place to worship. Uh, We're blessed that we have a place we can come here to this building uh, now we know that, that the church is not this building, it's just a structure, but we know that we are the church and wherever we meet, uh, the church is there. But at that time when God was with His people, a cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night leading them in the wilderness, <clears throat> while He was there they set up this place, a structure they could worship God, that they could continue to praise Him. And we've been looking at the different pieces of furniture that was there in that uh, place of the tabernacle. And we know that the first piece of furniture we spoke about was the altar of burnt offerings. That reminds us that Jesus is our sacrifice. Jesus died for our sins. The next piece of furniture is the wash basin. It is reminded that you have been cleansed. It is also an image of the baptism of a believer You're dead to the old life and the new life has begun. The next object was the table of showbread. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says that He is the bread of life and bread is needed for daily nourishment. The next object is the lampstand. We know that Jesus says He is the light of the world. And then the last sermon was about the altar of incense that remind us about prayer. And how when we pray, when they would go to the altar of incense and offer up the prayers, how it would go up to heaven, the smoke, and it reminds us that we are in constant prayer with our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I know in the last week, many of you have been doing probably much more praying than in the past. But today we get to the object called the Ark of the Covenant. And so today we look at Exodus chapter 25, starting with verse 10. They are to make an ark of Acadia wood, 45 inches long, 27 inches wide, and 27 inches high. This is God instructing Moses exactly how things are to be done. Overlay it with pure gold and overlay both sides inside and out. And also make a gold molding all around it. And cast four gold rings for it and place them and it's four feet, and two rings on the sides, and two rings on the other side. And make poles of Achaia wood, and overlay them with gold, and insert the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark, in order to carry the ark with them. The poles are to remain in the rings of the ark, and they must not be removed from it. Put the tablets of the testimony that I will give you in the ark, and make a mercy seat of pure gold, 45 inches long and 27 inches wide. And make two cherubims of gold and make them with a hammered work at the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherubim at one end and one cherubim at the other end. And at its two ends make the cherubims of one piece with the mercy seat. And the cherubims are to have wings spread above it out covering the mercy seat and their wings. And they are to face one another. The faces of the cherubim should be towards the mercy seat and the mercy seat on top of the ark. Put the testimony that I will give you into the ark and I will meet you there above the mercy seat between the two cherubims that are over the ark of the testimony. And I will speak to you from there about all that I command you regarding the Israelites. God is a God of order. God is not a God of chaos. And even in worship, God wanted things to be done a certain way. Even with the entrance of the tent, when they go in the worship, He had it facing the eastern side. And there was only one entrance. Everything that God was doing here in this text and throughout the entire Bible was setting up the plan of salvation for His Son Jesus to come into this world to redeem us from our sins. 
You see, when Adam and Eve sinned, it brought a sinful nature on all of us. And none of us, no matter how good we are, and and like I've said before, I've seen a lot of good out of God's people, but I've also seen a lot of good out of people who are atheists. So it's not just Christian people who can do good, but I've seen people doing good and know this, that being good is never good enough. It's just never good enough. You see, God does not grade on a curve. When I was in college, I was thankful that I had a math class when I was an undergraduate at Campbell that graded on a curve. Now let me explain what that meant. The professor said, whenever the first day of class, said this statement to the class, there's going to be, out of all this auditorium of students, so many A's, so many B's, so many C's, so many D's, and so many F's. And I'm going to grade it based on a curve. We're going to put all the grades in, and we're going to be, and be able to average it out. Now I thought to myself, well, that sounds good to me. I don't know math that well, but that math sounds good, especially if it means my grade goes up. And what it was saying is that if someone scored real low, then it basically could bring up the score of everyone. Well, when you're meeting in a college-type atmosphere where the instructor doesn't know you but only by a number or a seat, then really it doesn't matter who you are. It's just a grade. And sure enough, my test would come in. And it would be a C or a C plus or a B. Never really got anything higher than a B plus. But then when my final grade came in that semester, oh, I was so proud because I had an A. Because what happened is there was enough lower grades it bumped my grade up to an A. I didn't deserve an A. I didn't earn an A. But it was given to me because everyone else is lack. My friends, today, that's not how God does. You either pass or you fail. There's no such thing as grading up or grading down. Because God looks at the heart and He sees exactly what our intent is. And God knows if we are passing. And the only way we can pass is that we have been redeemed. We have been saved by His Son, Jesus Christ. The Ark of the Covenant was an image of God meeting His people. Once a year could the priest go into a place called the Holy of Holies. It was a tented area that the priest would walk in. And while he is in there in the Holy of Holies, he would pour a sacrificial blood offering on top of the Ark of the Covenant and seek out God's forgiveness. It's interesting that they would tie a rope around the priest. And they would put some bells there on the rope. And what those bells were for is if God didn't accept the sacrifice and the priest did not come in with clean hands and a clean heart, the priest would drop dead right there in front of the ark and they would have to drag his body out of the Holy of Holies. That's how serious God is about going before him. It's no joke, it's no laughing matter, it's no ha-ha business, it's no LOL. You see, God is serious about our worship and God is taking it serious the way we turn to Him. And see, this Ark of the Covenant is mentioned almost 200 times in the Old Testament. It was an important element of the Hebrew people. It's mentioned in 22 different locations. It had even been one time captured by the enemy. And the whole time the enemy had the Ark of the Covenant, if you read your Bible by now, that just nothing but disaster fell upon them. And they finally said, come and get this thing. We don't want it anymore. It's made of wood, but covered in gold. The reason it's done is because wood is a picture of our humanity and gold is a picture of the kingship of Christ. We know this is for a fact. In the Ark of the Covenant, there are three objects inside of it. And today that's what I want to do. I want to take all three objects and just go and list each one and explain why they put these three objects in the Ark of the Covenant. If you look at Hebrews chapter 9 verse 4, you'll find out exactly what those objects are and I'm going to share that with you today. Number one. If you were to open the Ark of the Covenant and look inside this gold box, you would find 
first, the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were put in there and they were not the broken commandments. Remember the first set of commandments that came down that whenever the people were sinning, and you remember what happens is the commandments are tossed down and they're broken, but then God allows more commandments, the same ten, but on new stones to be made. Those unbroken tablets are placed in the ark. The reason why is because it is a reminder of our moral direction as children of God. We have a moral standard as the people of God. Do you realize that you just can't do whatever you want to do? You have a standard. You have a guideline. You have what you're supposed to do as a saint of the Most High God. A few weeks ago, maybe not even that long, I called the Pender County Sheriff's Department because I was getting some folks in the neighborhood had said to me, have you seen there is a sign in our community that says, kill all white trash who hire illegal aliens. Now, you might have seen that. How many of you have seen there's a, a, a banner here in our town that says that? It says some other things, but it says that. And so some folks called me up and they said, can you believe something? That, I mean, that's a communicating a threat. I said, well, I will call the sheriff's department. Since you don't want to call, I'll call and I'll do it. So I picked up the phone and I called. They hadn't heard, no one had reported. They hadn't heard anything about it. That was before the news got hold of it, before social media, all of that. Let me quote exactly what was said to me on the phone. They said, can you send us a picture of that? I said, yes, I can. Here's my cell phone number. They gave me the cell and I sent them a picture. I talked to them. I said, you get it? Yes, we did. They said, because it doesn't say your name on it, and it just says white trash as a title, as a, a throw-off, we can't do a thing about it. And I said, now isn't that interesting? But if it had someone's name on it, they said, then it's, it would be illegal. You see, what happens in our society today is that we have, just think about this, we have thrown out the Ten Commandments, and by throwing out the Ten Commandments in our judicial system, it means basically you can do whatever you want to do. When I see something like that on there, I think to myself, what in the world are we coming to making those kind of comments? Is that really who we are? And I don't believe that's who we are. Do you? I don't believe that's the kind of people we are in this town. But what I do know when I see a sign like that, it reminds me is that we have, we have completely gotten away from a God-given order of the way things should be. We've gotten away from it. That's why people can basically do what they want to do and everything's just say okay Why do you think abortion is legal? Because we throw away the Ten Commandments. Why do you think gay marriage is legal? Because we throw away the Ten Commandments. Why is all the things you see on television just a okay because we've thrown away the Ten Commandments? Why do we have political parties that have such immoral standards? It's because we've thrown away the Ten Commandments. Why? I mean, don't get me started on this election season because you know for a fact the reason we're in the predicament we're in with our current president and possibly with the next president is because we have done away with God's standard. But best because we've done away with it does not mean it still does not exist. The Ten Commandments is there to remind us we're never good enough to make it in. You will never be able to keep all the commandments. And you say that you are able to keep them all? Well, there's an altar call will be given later. Because we're not. And I can remember so many times Billy Graham and his crusades, he'd preach and he'd say, if you've broken one of the commandments, you've broken all of the commandments. And I want to tell you today, my friends, is that God's standard is there to show us that we need Jesus. Because we are saved by the grace of God. But the law reminds us that we need grace. That's what the law reminds us of. I'll tell you another thing I've seen basically on that sign that someone's put up in our town. I've seen a lot of hateful, very discouraging comments about the man who put it up there. I've seen that as well. Let me say this to you point blank as members of Atkinson Baptist Church. 
What you need to be doing instead of attacking the man that put that sign up there, we should be praying that God touches his heart, that God will awaken his mind, and that God Almighty will put a vision of love and mercy in him. That's what we need to be doing besides just attacking because when we attack someone, we're no better than that other person. We are no better, and I will just say that. if You can like it or lump it, but we are no better. You'll get what lumping means later on, I guess. But isn't that what we should do? Have a moral guide, but we don't have it. The most comical thing, I guess, about having that sign up, if you want to find anything comical about it, is that our town, I understand, has voted to spend $300 to put up their own sign to counteract that. One of the biggest waste of money I could see in resources. You know how you counteract it? You show love. You don't have to print it on a billboard to say that you love. You simply show it. That's what we're doing with our Red Cross coming later today. That's what we're doing by giving out water. That's what we're doing by doing everything else we do. You show the love. You don't have to advertise the love on a sign. Right? The second thing that's in the Ark of the Covenant was a jar of manna. A golden jar of manna. You remember what manna was? People of God, when they were wandering all that time for 40 years in the desert, they didn't have a Burger King to pull up to. They didn't have a McDonald's. I mean, they weren't loving it. In fact, they didn't love the manna at all. They wanted something else. But God provided them food every single day. And I'll tell you another thing that J.C. Penney's and Sears wouldn't have liked. God didn't allow their, their clothes to wear out either. I like that as well. I wish that was the same case. But the reason why there's a jar of manna inside the Ark of the Covenant, and what's amazing about that, if you remember, God said they couldn't store the manna overnight unless it was on the Sabbath, because if they did, it says that plum, it would, maggots would get into it. But the reason why this manna was preserved is because it was in the presence of God, and it was reminding them that God is our daily provider of what we need. That's why the Bible says, give us this day our daily bread. Why? Because we need God every day. Have you ever stored up something? Man, it was a good deal. Maybe you went to one of these big places like a warehouse store, Costco's or Sam's, and you bought all this stuff because, man, it was a good deal. And you never used it, and it went out of date, and you had to throw it away. I've had that situation where I've bought stuff, thought, man, I'll, die. I'm a, I'm a, I'll use it or give it away to someone. And before you know it, it goes out of date, and you have to toss it. You know, this was God reminding us we need Him every single day. We can't just store it up and say, I've got enough of the blessings of God from when I first got saved. I will say this to you, you need to be in communion and fellowship with God every day. You say, well, Pastor Ken, I get it on Sunday and Wednesday. Wow. If that's the only time that you're in communion with God, it would be like me saying that I'm only going to feed you on Sunday and Wednesday. Now, how many of you know that come Tuesday afternoon, you used to get a little hungry? I'd get hungry Sunday night. Come on now, folks. Y'all still with me? Is, did the water get in your ears also? I mean, come on. Are you listening to me? God is wanting to fellowship with you daily. It's a daily work. The third thing. So we see the Ten Commandments. We see the jar of manna. And third and final, there is the rod or the staff of Aaron that's inside the Ark of the Covenant. Why is an ark having a rod or a staff inside of it? If you read the book of Numbers chapter 17, you find out the reason why. is because, believe it or not, God delivers His people. He uses Moses and Aaron to do it. Now I know what I'm about to tell you is going to blow you out of the water and you're not going to believe it. But do you know that God had a leader... And do you know the people grumbled that they didn't like who God chose to be the leader? Oh, they, they, they had what they needed, but they said, no, we don't like this. We don't like that Aaron's getting this special privileges. We don't like that Moses is in a place of authority. And so the tribe started grumbling and fussing. Now, aren't you glad all this time later that God's people don't do that? Some things don't change, do they? Here what we see is that Moses said, All right, 
God had instructed him, he says, tell the leaders, the twelve tribes, to write their name on their staff. And I want you to write their name on it and leave it overnight. And when God will do a miracle, and what the miracle will be is that that rod or that staff, that stick, that when he comes back, that it will not only blossom, but it will produce fruit. Now you think about this. How many of you know that if I go cut a branch off of a tree, it doesn't have the nourishment it needs anymore. It's no longer connected anymore. It is virtually dead, is it not? I mean, I've seen that people take, and you, I, you might not know this, but it's illegal to get cattails. You know what a cattail is? Not real cats, folks. They, the, it's the, they grow up in the ditches and all throughout the county. You know, they're protected. We don't supposed to pull them out. My grandma found that out. She saw some around the house and was and getting some up out of the ditch. And, and the Wallace police pulled up and said, What are you doing, Miss Tobin? Well, I'm getting this cattail to put in a vase at home. And the policeman said, Well, do you know I could arrest you for that? My grandma said, I was just putting this cattail right back in the ditch where I found it from. <laughs> But when you take that cattail or anything away from its source of life, guess what starts happening? It dies, right? The next day to go back out, none of these pieces of wood should have had anything done to it. But the one who had Aaron's name wrote on it, guess what happens? When they go pick it up, it not only had blossoms, it had produced on it. Production, fruit, it had something. You know what this reminds us of why God allowed that to be in there? It reminds us that God still brings life to dead things. Some of you are going to get that. Come on now. God still brings life to even to some dead churches. Doesn't He? We hope. We pray. And so what we learn from that is that there is life after death. Every one of you in here will die including myself, unless Jesus Christ comes back and takes us right now, we will be caught up with Him. But the thing is, if that doesn't happen today and it doesn't happen in your life, we will die, but yet we shall live. If He can bring life to an old stick where it can still produce fruit, He can bring life to you and I. And more importantly, if God can raise His Son on the third day, And if Jesus can speak to Lazarus in the tomb on the fourth day, when the Bible says, Lord, he stinketh. Don't you know, friends, he can bring life to you and to me? Now, let me close. The Bible talks about this Ark of the Covenant. And it says that it's also mentioned to be called the Ark of Jehovah, the Ark of Elohim, or the Ark of the Testimony. But the main thing, no matter what we mention about the Ten Commandments and the jar of manna and Aaron's staff being inside of the ark, the main thing is that that's where they went to seek out the presence of God. The high priest would go and have fellowship, seek God out. Let me tell you this. We don't know where the Ark of the Covenant is. Now, if you read in the book of Revelation, it's interesting the Ark of the Covenant is there in heaven. I I believe that God has got a plan and a purpose when we get to heaven. You're going to see the golden lampstand, the menorah in heaven. You're going to see the table of incense. You're going to see all these furniture pieces there in heaven. It's going to be there. The Bible says there will be a new heaven and a new earth. You will see that there. The main point about today's message is this, is that when the people got to God, the only way they could get to Him is they had to go to the Ark of the Covenant. That's where God said, I will meet you. I will dwell there. Now, here's good news for you and I. We no longer live in that time period. We no longer have to go and sprinkle blood on the Ark of the Covenant. Jesus has gone to the cross and His blood has already been shed for us. It was sprinkled there on Calvary. We no longer have to get a priest (coughs) to have a rope tied around him to go into the Holy of Holies. You don't need that anymore. You don't need someone to go there for you. The Bible says that you can boldly go to the throne of God. The Bible also says that Jesus is our intercessor. You know what that means? 
Being an intercessor means that that's the person that can go to God for us. And how many of you know that when the child goes to the parent, oh man, it changed, it's so much different, isn't it? My favorite story that I have, and I can remember it, it just, it, it's one that I will always cherish because God spoke to my heart through this. And I've told this for several times here at this church, and some of you might not have ever heard it, and some of you have, but please just have patience. As I can remember so vividly being uh, at a church pastor in, in, a, in an office and had a very important meeting, and told my secretary at the time that I don't need to be interrupted, phone call or visitor for no reason whatsoever. Do not, no interruptions. Yes, sir, I understand. Well, my child didn't understand what that meant. And so my child shows up and Zoe comes to the office to see her daddy because she was in preschool. We had a school at the church during the week and she said, I want to see my daddy before I go home. The secretary said, I'm sorry, you can't. He's in a meeting. The door's closed. You can't go in there. But that's my daddy. She walks up there and opens that door and she walks right in that meeting. And you know what happens? I stopped the meeting right where I'm at. Had people sitting around the table talking, getting some stuff done. I stopped and said, what is it? What can I do for you? Now, How many of you know that's what a parent does, doesn't it? When your own blood comes to you and says, hey, I want to speak to you, what is it you need, right? If anybody else would have came in there, now I would have probably been a little different. Now, you know, I... What's going on? Well, I'm having a meeting here. Can this wait? Right? Do you know when Jesus goes to his Father, God, God's going to listen. You know why? It's because right now it says Jesus is on the right side, right hand of the Father. He's going to the Father as an intercessor. And when we stand before God Almighty on the day of judgment, here's good news. You know what will get us into heaven? Not because we've had sacrifices, not because we have washed our hands in the golden basin, not because we've done any of those things. What will get us there is because we are saved and Jesus will look at His Father and say, that's, that's one of your children. I died for Him and He accepted me. And God's going to say, okay, come on in. <coughs> Folks, today will you please consider that? Throughout Hurricane Matthew, no matter what you lost... It can be replaced. But my friends, what about our relationship with the Lord? What about our relationship with God? This altar is open for prayer for yourself, for your community, for someone else, for our town. Simply for those coming to eat later when the Red Cross gets here. We need to be in prayer for these people. But not only being a social gospel. I, I mean, I'm not in the sense of just feed them, clothe them and send them home. But if they don't know about Jesus, then what you'll have is somebody with a full belly and a coat on his back and still going to hell. And so these people need to know Jesus loves them and Jesus can save them. Let's pray.